All right, let's start. Hi everyone, I'm the Fur Hat Robot, and welcome to this webinar. It is great to see so many of you here. We will be talking about my eyes today. Aren't they lovely? But I don't use my eyes to see, I use my camera. It's here in my chest. My vision is really important to me. It allows me to interact with my surroundings and be social. I'm a social robot, you see, so that is important to me. Let me show you what I'm seeing right now by sharing my screen with you. So now you see what I'm seeing. You can see that my human friend is here. Hey Nils, how are you today? I'm excellent today. Really looking forward to doing this webinar with you. Good to hear that. Nils will be doing demonstrations today of my vision system. And Jonas, are you there too? Yes, absolutely. There you are. Jonas is one of the founders and therefore one of my oldest friends. He will tell you about how my vision system works, and I think he will share some stories from the early days as well. Anyway, great to see you all. Nils, can you take it from here? Yes, sure, I will. Thank you, Farhat. And welcome everyone again to this webinar where we will talk about the vision of the Farhat robot and why this is so important to create rich and engaging interactions. Uh, with a machine and our social robot, Furhat. For those of you who haven't heard about Furhat Robotics before, we are a Swedish startup that was founded based on the research from four professors and PhDs from KTH Royal Institute of Technology. We are here today uh, in, at, the, at still at the campus of uh, KTH uh, and in our little makeshift studio that we have built here during these corona times so we can uh, have an engagement with our community uh, and uh, potential customers and our uh, existing customers. So we're very excited to show you a little demo of the robot vision system here today and to talk a bit more in depth about the vision system. What you're seeing right now is you're seeing me through the eyes of the robot. Uh, so you have the web interface in front of you uh, and you can see the, the camera view of course here little bounding box that is tracking my face uh, and you can see beneath there there is a uh, the situation model where the user which is me is being mapped out in the, in the interaction space there are also some buttons there that i'm managing to manage this uh, this demo with the with the third robot yeah so uh, during today we will do some some demos using uh, this interface uh, where you can see from the robot's perspective of what's going on uh, with me today, I also have Jonas Desko, uh, one of the co-founders of Parat Robotics, and uh, also a professor here at KTH. Uh, Jonas has a long history of uh, working with computer vision, but also with uh, uh, 3D animation. So Jonas also is responsible for the 3D animation of the, of the robots. Uh, perhaps we'll do a separate webinar on that on another occasion. Great. Uh, before I hand it over to Jonas, I would like to just uh, say a few things about the format of this webinar. So like I said, I will do some demos. Jonas will talk more in depth about what's going on. Uh, and in the end, we will have a Q&A section. So all the questions you might have uh, that come up during the webinar, please post them in the Q&A section and we'll get to them in the end. Great. Uh, with those words, I would like to hand it over to Jonas. Thanks a lot, Nils, and uh, thank you, Furhat. Uh, so, um, as Nils said, my name is uh, Jonas Besko. I'm a co-founder of Ferret Robotics, and I'm also one of the engineers behind the vision solution in the Ferret Robot platform. Uh, so today I'm going to present an overview of the Ferret vision system and give you some ideas on how you can use this for your benefit to make uh, interactive uh, human robot experiences. Uh, but first, let's take a look back and uh, uh, say a few things about the human visual system and uh, why it is uh, relevant to a social robot. So let me just share my screen and we will get... Uh, humans are social beings. So this is something essentially 
the species has evolved over millions of years. And uh, the reason that uh, humans have succeeded so well on this planet is because we are uh, so good at collaborating and uh, communicating with each other. And a lot of this is due to our social skills, obviously. So evolution has really given us very refined ways of perceiving uh, other people. And especially uh, faces is uh, something that we're very sensitively tuned to. And as an example, I can just show you a few uh, pictures here. So essentially our brains are so tuned in fact to detecting faces that we will see faces also where they are not present. In, in some sense, you could call this a bug of the uh, human visual system. So we see them in objects and in environments everywhere. Uh, but uh, it's more than just detecting faces because we're also uh, very good at identifying people based on their facial appearance. So if we uh, meet someone that we have seen before, we can immediately recognize them. Even if we don't know them by name, we can still relate to, uh, to them by their face. And this is very important also for, for social bonding. So, um, uh, yes. And uh, another aspect of this is that uh, uh, we can also tell by looking at the person where they are directing their attention. So in, in particular, we're very good at seeing if they are looking directly at us, if we are the target of their attention. Uh, and uh, this phenomenon of mutual gaze is very powerful and frequent in human-human uh, -human communication. But we can also tell if they're focusing on a particular object. Uh, and then we're referring to joint attention. If, if two people are looking at the same object, this is very important cue and uh, important uh, uh, aspect also in, in learning and uh, interaction. Uh, finally, a person's face will also tell something about their inner state in many cases. So we can judge someone's emotions or attitudes uh, from their face. Uh, so what does all of this have to do with robots? Well, essentially at Ferret Robotics, we have a very ambitious agenda. Essentially we want to build uh, the world's most advanced social robot. And for a robot to interact socially with humans, it must not only be able to detect faces, but also to understand them uh, and, and what they represent. So uh, uh, before we dive into the current technology, let me just uh, take, a, take you a few years back in time uh, to even before the company was founded, but uh, some of you might know that Furhat actually comes out of a research department in, in, at the KTH University. Uh, and already in 2011, we had the first early prototype of this robot in the research lab, and we exhibited it at uh, a museum, at the Lo uh, London Science Museum. And uh, in this setting, we wanted it to be able to interact uh, with the participants, uh, but we didn't have a vision system that was uh, robust enough, at least, uh, to deal with this kind of crowded situation. So in that uh, setting, we resorted to a very primitive but effective solution to have a proximity sensor next to the microphone. So whenever someone walked up to the microphone, uh, the sensor would just trigger uh, and start the interaction. Uh, of course, this is, is a very crude way, and it doesn't really scale up to, to any kind of naturalistic interactions. Uh, but it, it worked for that case. And in uh, 2014, at, at another museum, in this case, uh, at the Science Museum in Stockholm, uh, we had a more advanced system based on the Kinect sensor, the Microsoft Kinect, which is a depth sensitive sensor that does a lot of the processing uh, on the device. So it will uh, give you uh, information about uh, the people that are in front of it in terms of their body, uh, sort of gives you a skeleton of these people. And uh, it's uh, uh, fairly robust in the sense that it also emits light. So it emits infrared light. So that means that it's uh, also can work essentially in darkness. Uh, we had a problem here though, because when people were sitting down uh, in front of a table, 
uh, it it wasn't as robust because you it couldn't see their full uh, bodies uh, and also since it was an external device uh, it's kind of a bulky solution so um, it's definitely far from ideal so in 2018 when we released our new robot we really had to think long and hard about what kind of vision solution to put into the Ferret robot. This is the Ferret version 2, the one that is currently available. And um, essentially we had two choices there. So we could either go with a, uh, something similar to the Kinect, a depth sensor, a specialized uh, camera that uh, has also some vision processing hardware embedded. Or we could go with a more general solution with a, uh, with a more plain video camera, an RGB stream much like a webcam uh, coupled with uh, uh, more uh, processing algorithms in software and uh, by looking at the way the whole computer vision field was moving at that time and still is moving this was a pretty uh, obvious choice for us we felt that uh, uh, video processing especially with the advent of uh, deep neural networks uh, is really uh, changing the way computer vision works uh, and so vision from plain video uh, is always uh, almost always as robust or, or uh, and often very much more flexible than uh, specialized solutions based on uh, for example depth sensors uh, so we decided to build in uh, a camera uh, a regular video camera then into the robot uh, so uh, this is uh, a view on the sort of under the hood. Uh, this is an uh, RGB, stands for red, green, blue, uh, standard, uh, very similar to what you, uh, uh, to a web camera. The main difference is being that this one is specifically uh, designed to cope with low light conditions. Uh, and it also has a much wider angle than a regular web camera would have. And this is important because the robot should be uh, able to deal with multiple participants. Uh, so you, you would want it to be able to pick up a, a small crowd standing in front of the robot and being to interact, being able to, to turn to different people and, and see them sort of. Uh, another Equally important part of the vision processing hardware is the CPU. As I mentioned, uh, uh, this camera doesn't do any processing of its own, so all the processing has to be handled by the CPU. Uh, and in our case, we've chosen to uh, bundle a pretty uh, capable processor, an i5. This is similar to what you find in a, in a good uh, uh, laptop. And uh, it also has an integrated graphics uh, processing unit. And this is important because this can be used to offload computations. Of course, in our case, the graphics processing unit is used also for the facial animation since we're using animated face on the robot. But it actually has uh, capacity left to also handle parts of the computer vision tasks, which offloads the main CPU. So we're really utilizing this uh, hardware in the best way. And comparing it to other, many other social robots uh, that frequently use um, uh, low energy uh, uh, processors designed for embedding, uh, there's uh, a quite significant difference in performance. So here's an example where we compare the processor in the fur hat to the processor in another popular social robot on the market. And you can see that uh, the, uh, the capacity of the CPU is several times uh, the other processor. And this uh, is another set of numbers for the floating point uh, calculations on the graphics processing unit of these uh, processors. So there is an even bigger difference. Uh, and, and we essentially need this capacity to be able to do uh, the vision algorithms that I will tell you about next. So the Ferret Vision stack then consists of a few layers. So at the, at the bottom layer, we have the hardware, the, the camera, the CPU, and the GPU. 
Uh, on top of that, we have the core vision algorithms th that we refer to internally as CAM core. And these are essentially C++ uh, um, algorithms uh, and uh, highly optimized uh, underlying libraries for inference of uh, uh, deep neural networks. And then on top of this, we have the skill layer, and this is really the application programming uh, layer where, where uh, any developer working with the SDK can, can interface with, uh, with the algorithms and use the information that comes out of them to build uh, human-robot interactions. Recently, we've also been adding the capability of hooking into this chain so if you want to extend the processing capabilities, for example, you can do so by, by tapping into the camera stream from a, uh, for example, from a remote uh, computer. I will tell you more about this uh, in a little bit. Uh, taking a look at the pipeline, the whole flow then of the vision process, it starts with, with frame grabbing, essentially a frame being captured by the onboard camera, this is then fed into a face detection network, a, a DNN deep neural network that detects faces in the frame. This one operates on the full frame and then comes up with little bounding boxes. Then we have a re-identification network that is about being able to um, associate different users with, uh, with different uh, keys essentially so we can then track them over time so we can keep uh, uh, the same a consistent uh, ID number for each user. Uh, we also estimate their pose and their location in 3D space. Uh, and finally, we also uh, estimate uh, gestures or emotion, ex emotional expressions from the faces. So I'm going to go through these steps uh, one by one, and this will also be interspersed with the uh, a few demos uh, on the robot itself. And uh, this whole pipeline then runs uh, 10 times per second, all of these uh, steps. So the first step then, uh, the face detection is essentially uh, a matter of uh, finding faces uh, in the video frame. And um, this is done using a single shot detector uh, it's a deep neural network architecture that does all of these, finds all of these uh, uh, bounding boxes in a single pass. And this is important because it means that it runs in constant time. So no matter if you put 100 people in front of the robot, it will still only take the same amount of time to, uh, to detect these faces. Uh, so it makes it very predictable. It's also very robust. So it will handle different lighting conditions, different post shifts if you're moving, even if you're uh, upside down for some reason, it will, it will still track your face. Uh, or if you're occluding, uh, masking the face uh, in different ways, it will still uh, be able to find uh, the face in, in pretty much all the time. Um, uh, in terms of accuracy, it's about state of the art. Uh, if you compare it to other deep neural network solutions. And uh, it should be pointed out that this is really the most, uh, well, it's the most processing heavy step, but it's also the most crucial step in the whole vision pipeline, because if this fails, then the whole interaction will likely fail. Uh, so we really can't afford to simply lose track of a user uh, because that will cause the whole uh, interaction to terminate if, if the, robot doesn't think that there's anyone in front of it, then it will uh, usually stop the interaction. So that leads to a terrible user experience. So this is really something that has to work and it has to work under also very uh, harsh conditions sometimes. And uh, now uh, Nils and Farhat will show you that uh, this is indeed the case. Thank you, Jonas. Nils, can we share my screen? so that they can see things from my perspective? Yes, give me a second. There we go. Nice. You can now see Nils in my camera view. 
and you can see the green bounding box around his face. That means his face is being detected. I'll be quiet now and let Nils demonstrate the face detection. Great, uh, thank you for that. And as you can see, you're now seeing the, uh, the, the view from the robot's point of view. So let me just take a minute to explain you uh, the web interface that you're seeing here. So you have the camera view where I'm standing and you can see me moving around and you can see the, the bounding box that it's, it's actually currently tracking my face. Uh, beneath it here, you can see the situation model uh, where the user is being mapped uh, in a interaction space. And if there were multiple users, we will be uh, more and more people will be added into this interaction space. I'll talk a little bit more about that when we do the other demos. Uh, when we talk more about the, the later stages of the of the computer vision and the, the computer vision pipeline. Uh, so what I would like to show you now is the that robustness that Jonas talked about that is so important that. Uh, you know, the robot cannot lose track of a user because the whole interaction will break down from there. Uh, so to give you a demonstration of uh, the robustness of, uh, of our system and to show you uh, how that works, uh, let me um, try to make it a little bit harder for the, for, for the robot. So uh, let's turn off the lights or at least dim the lights and see how well the, the computer vision system uh, performs uh, with facial detection in, in low light conditions. So let me turn on the, 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 the <coughs> dimmers just here and I'll turn off all the other lights in the room. Oops. There we go. So now we are in what I would call like a museum lighting. Uh, it's fairly dark and there's just a few spotlights in the ceiling. And as you can see, I, the green bounding box is still around my face so the robot has no problem uh, detecting my face. Yeah, so let's make this a little bit harder and actually turn off the lights completely. I'm gonna turn down my laptop as well. So now it's basically the only the light source in this room is the robot itself and uh, and a little screen here that is in front of the robot. Uh, and you can see this is even this is is enough for the robot to detect my my face and be able to uh, pick up there's a user standing in front of it. Uh, so it really works well in in low light conditions. Uh, let me turn the lights back on. Uh, and uh, show you another uh, important part of the the robustness of the the face detection, and that is, uh, you know, you can obstruct the faces. Uh, maybe you're thinking, or you're panicking, or uh, you don't know what's happening, and it's still uh, making sure to pick up the faces. In these times, uh, of course, we have to try it. Uh, can it detect the face even when you're wearing a a surgical mask like this and as you can see the bounding box there is still intact and uh, it has no problem uh, detecting that there is a face there and a person. Uh, so uh, how far can we go? <laughs> uh, let's push it a little bit harder and see how, uh, how far we can go. So let me put on my disguise here. We'll put on some sunglasses. Uh, I have a, a beard that I will put on and see uh, how well the robot copes now. It's still be able to track and find my face. Let me put on a fur hat. We have plenty of fur hats lying around in the office. And you can see it's starting to struggle right now. It's, it's not uh, in, entirely impossible for me to pick up, for it to pick up the face, but it's definitely uh, struggling. Uh, but hopefully a user interacting with the robot uh, will not be wearing disguise uh, like this. Uh, and as Jonas mentioned, the, the reason why this is important is to have that robustness in the interaction that the robot never loses track of a user uh, and will restart the interaction or you know, uh, not be aware that there's a person standing in front of it. Uh, and this also is true for when having multiple people. Uh, so we need to have it to be fast to be able to recognize uh, people uh, fast. So I, to simulate multiple users, I have uh, printed uh, a paper here with, with plenty of people and I will put it in front of the camera uh, to simulate multiple users standing in front of the robot. And as you can see, it has no problem detecting uh, multiple faces uh, at once and it's, it's very quick. Uh, let's add some more people, see uh, if that will sort of break the, the system. Uh, and as you can see here, it immediately recognizes the most, uh, the people standing closest. 
Uh, and if I zoom in, uh, you can see it starts to pick up the people that are uh, that were not uh, recognized in the beginning. People all the way in the back there, their faces are actually so blurry in this picture that you can't really make out that these are our people. Uh, great, so that was a little demo of the face <coughs> detection, which is the, the first step in the, in the computer vision stack. Uh, next up, uh, Jonas will talk to you about uh, the, to be able to recognize a face and to be able to track it uh, when, when it's moving around, which is another critical uh, step of uh, having that robust uh, experience with uh, computer vision. Uh, so Jonas, please tell us more about that. Thank you, Niels. Uh, so let me just get my slides up here. There we go. Yes, so the purpose of the re-identification stage is to establish the identity of the faces that are present. And the purpose of this is not really to uh, establish the absolute identity. I mean, we're not really interested in connecting this uh, to a name or to, to some true identity of a person, but it's more that we, we're interested in seeing if this is a person that we have interacted with before. And in that case, we want to make sure that the uh, interaction builds on that. So we don't start from scratch every time uh, a face appears because that would lead to a very annoying user experience. Imagine, for example, that you're at an airport, if we uh, consider this use case that the robot is uh, uh, acting as a customer service agent and you go up to it and uh, you ask for some information about your flight. Uh, and then for some reason you have to uh, uh, leave the robot for a while and then you come back. Uh, and then you want the robot to be able to recognize that this is actually someone that I talk to two minutes ago, so then it will uh, continue where you were rather than starting over uh, from the beginning. So this is how we imagine that identification of faces is going to be, uh, is, is a crucial feature for a social robot. Uh, and the way we do this is by using something that we refer to as face prints. It's also known as face embeddings in literature. Uh, the idea is quite uh, straightforward in, in theory that we take uh, uh, the bounding box uh, around the face and we feed this into a deep neural network that is specifically trained to output the representation uh, that is essentially a vector of uh, 256 numbers and they are calculated in such a way that when the same face um, uh, when, the, when the face of the same person uh, is fed through this network it will result in a vector that is very similar. So, so if you compare uh, two, two images of the same person taken at different instances in time, or by different cameras for that matter, uh, they will still uh, uh, be very close together in this uh, high dimensional space. But if you take a snapshot from another person, uh, they will be uh, far apart in the space. So this makes it possible to compare uh, the faces over time and see if this is someone that we have encountered previously. Now that we have this, uh, this is a closely related then to the, uh, to the tracking stage. And this is essentially about giving each user an ID. Uh, so the ID, uh, this is a numerical ID, just starting from, from zero for the first user and growing, but we want to make sure that once you have been assigned an ID, uh, you should keep that during the whole interaction, essentially for as long as the robot is, uh, uh, is on. Um, and then uh, this means that users are tracked over time from one uh, time step to the next. In practice, uh, uh, the vision system will predict the next position of the user for every time frame, and then it will match that predicted position with the incoming uh, detections and do an optimal assignment of these. So, so that makes, makes it possible to follow someone over time step by step. However, uh, there are cases when uh, there will be no detection for a person, maybe because they are passing behind someone else or because they are uh, 
uh, moving out a view from the camera or they're turning their back or something. And in those cases, when this person reappears, we use the face print uh, to check if this user is actually someone that we have encountered before. And in, if it is, then it will, they will uh, get their uh, previous ID uh, reassigned. And now we will look at how this works uh, on the robot. All right. Thanks, Jonas. Nils, do you mind screen sharing the web interface again? Sure. Okay. There we are. You can see my trusted assistant with a green bounding box around his face. If you look closely, there is a user ID assigned to him. If he would disappear from my view, I should be able to recognize his face again. Yeah, so let's try that. I will disappear from the view of Furhat, and when I reappear, uh, I should have the same uh, user ID there. Uh, so that's the be able to recognize a user when the user leaves and comes back, but it's also be able to recognize when you're uh, within frame. Uh, so let's uh, add another user in the vision here to make it a little bit more, more complicated for, uh, for, for Furhat. So we will have two users and they are moving around uh, and the robot will have to keep track of their of their faces as they're as they're moving around and even passing uh, in front of each other uh, with, with faces overlapping like this yeah and you can see the user id there of the user is, is, is still intact during the entire interaction uh, so this is another sort of fundamental aspect of uh, the computer vision system of the robot that is able to not, not only detect people, but also keep track of them in the space and with multiple users and chaotic environment that are the real world situations where we expect the robot to be to deployed, right? Uh, so these are, like I said, the real fundamentals of the robot. The next step would be to react more to the attention of the user. Where, where is the user paying attention or what, what is the emotional state of the user? use that in the interaction, really start digging into the social aspects of the interaction, and not just the basic of having an interaction at all. Uh, so I will let Jonas tell you a little bit more about that, and then we'll come back and we'll do another demo uh, of, uh, of that uh, attention and uh, emotion detection. Great, so Jonas, please tell us more about that. Yes, absolutely. Um... Let me get my screen back up here. Okay, so the next uh, stage in the pipeline is then the pose estimation. Uh, and this is essentially that for each detected face, we want to establish two things. One is the 3D, three-dimensional location uh, of the user. And this is important because uh, we want the, the robot to be able to, of course, turn its head and, uh, and meet the gaze of the user. So we, so we need to know where they are in space. We need to be able to follow them around uh, so the robot can show its attention towards the user. And uh, likewise, we need to know the head rotation of the user, so um, uh, whether or not they are facing the robot. Uh, so essentially, this means that there are two sets of uh, uh, metrics that we want to extract. One is the location uh, in 3D space in XYZ, and the other one is the orientation of the user in the angles uh, uh, that we refer to as jaw, pitch, and roll. Uh, and this together then gives the complete uh, estimate for every user, and this is fed into the uh, situation model that. Uh, essentially comprises all the knowledge that the, uh, that the skill, uh, the higher level system has about the, uh, about the user. So let's have a look uh, what this, uh, how this works on the robot, uh, Nils and Ferhat. Right, thank you, Jonas. Me and Nils will now demonstrate the head pose estimation as a way to detect if the user is paying attention to me or not. Nils, are we sharing my screen so they can see what is going on? Yes. Okay, good. It seems I have Nils' full attention. Nils, 
pay attention. Okay, now I have your attention. Hey Nils, I said pay attention. All right, now I have your attention. Nils, time to pay attention to me. All right, now I have your attention. Okay, I think that is enough. Yes, thank you for that. Uh, that was a great demo uh, of how you can use the head post estimation in order to estimate the attention of the user to use in your interaction. Uh, in this case, to grab their attention when they're, when they're looking away. But it can, of course, be utilized in, in many different ways. Uh, in a multi-part interaction, perhaps you want to know if the user is looking at the other person, if they're looking down at the screen, or if they're looking up on the robot. Uh, but you can also uh, get the more exact uh, coordinates from the from the head post estimation uh, and you as you can see here in the situation model and the user uh, you can see the line here for where I'm uh, where I'm looking and also if I check if I change the to the side view here you can also see here if I'm looking down on the robot or if I'm or if I'm looking up uh, so we're starting it into the parts of the facial of oh, sorry of the uh, vision system where you really start to get into the level where you are in the interaction uh, with, the inter with the user. Um, so next thing we want to sh talk about and want to show you is the emotion detection, how to detect emotion and then respond to, to that uh, in, your, in your interaction with the robot. Uh, so Jonas here will tell you a little bit more about that and then uh, we'll get back to the demo and we'll, we'll show it to you as well. So Jonas, uh, uh, tell us a little more about the emotion detection and especially the smile uh, detection part, which uh, is probably the most interesting element of that. Uh, let me bring up my slides again. Uh, and we will continue with the gesture detection. Yes, yeah, so by, in this case, by gestures, uh, we're really talking about facial gestures. Uh, so people use uh, uh, their face all the time, obviously, to, um, uh, to express emotions, for example. Uh, and uh, this is a relatively new feature in the robot that, uh, that we now have a network, um, also same, same kind of um, deep neural network that will uh, detect emotional expressions. Uh, and uh, we refer to these as gestures because essentially they are gestures that you uh, that you do to express a certain emotion, and uh, it's possible then to access them uh, when you're uh, programming um, your uh, your interactions, your skills, um, and um, currently what we have found to be most robust uh, and to uh, also most useful uh, is. Uh, the gesture of uh, expression of happiness, which is a smile, essentially. So, um, so this is what we're supporting out of the box in the robot. It is possible to access also the other uh, emotions if one has a, uh, a need for them. But, uh, but right now, smile detection is sort of the, the focus on what you can uh, easily use at the skill level. And this would look something like this. This is a, a snippet from, from how you would uh, write it. Um, uh, in the Kotlin language that is used to, to build a skill. So essentially an event that says on user gesture, uh, user gesture smile, uh, this would then trigger a corresponding smile from the robot. So for a gesture would, would make the robot smile. And uh, this is a very fundamental um, behavior, of course, in humans that we, uh, it's almost uh, hard to resist if, if we meet someone that gives us a smile, we have sort of the, the, the built-in instinct to, to smile back at them, essentially. Uh, so it's, it's very easy as you need to, to make the robot to have that kind of behavior as well. Uh, and uh, along with many other uh, things that you can do. And now we will uh, let Nils and Farhat show how this uh, works. Yes, thank you. Uh, and to show this, uh, I will uh, start this uh, separate skill uh, that will uh, be able to, uh, so the first can tell me a joke uh, and based on my reaction or my response, uh, it will uh, decide if that was a, a uh, if I like the joke or not. 
so this is a very crude and simple way <laughs> to use this uh, this uh, this based uh, smile detection. Uh, so let's see. Hi there. Oh, sorry. Maybe I should uh, share my screen so you can see what the robot is seeing. Uh, I think that's helpful. Uh, so there we are, right? <coughs> and you can actually see here uh, in my wizard box, I, I have uh, some buttons here to uh, adjust the threshold of, uh, of the smile, uh, how, how easy it is should for, for the robot to, to pick up a smile. Uh, but let's, uh, let's, let's start and see uh, how, how, how well it performs. A slice of apple pie is $2.50 in Jamaica and $3 in the Bahamas. These are the pie rates of the Caribbean. I agree, that is a bad joke. A slice of apple pie is $2.50 in Jamaica and $3 in the Bahamas. These are the pie rates of the Caribbean. Tell me another joke, we heard that one. Justice is a dish best served cold. If it were served warm, it would be just water. I agree, that is a bad joke. I'm reading a book about anti-gravity. It's impossible to put down. <laughs> Glad you liked it. Do you want to hear another one? Yeah, take one more. What do you call a dog that can do magic? A labracadabrador. <laughs> Glad you liked it. Do you want to hear another one? Uh, no, thank you. No worries. So as you can see there, the, that was a quick demonstration of the robot being able to detect uh, my smiles. But as Jonas mentioned, the real power that uh, this feature have is really to, the ability to be able to smile back when a user is smiling and to use it more in the, uh, uh, the automatic behavior of the robot. Um, and as Jonas also mentioned, this is a, a new feature that we just included in the 119 release that released a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we are currently working on another feature uh, that we will be releasing in the 120 release that we will release any day now. Um, and that is the last thing we would like to share with you today. Uh, and it's probably uh, the most exciting, I think, uh, for, for many of you, especially uh, the researchers out there who want to uh, not just use the built-in functionalities uh, of the computer vision of the robot, but uh, augment it and use your own algorithms and uh, and uh, to be able to do that. Uh, so uh, Jonas uh, will tell you a little bit more about uh, exactly what that feature is and also give you maybe some inspiration of, uh, of what, what you can do with that. Yes, thank you, Nils. Uh, I will, uh, let me bring up my uh, slides again. Yes, so this final feature uh, has a uh, straightforward name of camera stream access and the idea is that uh, whenever uh, you need to do something that is not supported by the built-in vision system you can use this feature uh, to access the camera stream uh, externally so um, and this is uh, uh, a very straightforward uh, protocol essentially so we essentially whenever the uh, a new camera frame is captured, it is encoded as JPEG and streamed over a socket. So it's easy to, uh, to have a client application, for example, in Python or in other, uh, any other programming language that reads these frames and uh, uh, does something to them, process them or, or store them for a, for a log and so on. And an important aspect of this is that each frame is timestamped as they are captured uh, by the camera. So we know exactly uh, the timing that makes it possible to to link it to other events or to to the, the speech recognition, for example, or to uh, to other things going on in the dialogue, uh, and that can be very uh, convenient and important. So, what do you want to use this for? Then, well, it's basically up to you. You can have your own computer vision solutions if you have uh, your own uh, emotion detector or. Uh, um, some, some kind of object detection system. Um, this is one of the things that we're not uh, uh, providing out of the box uh, right now, for example, uh, but there might be other uh, things. You can use it for logging and for monitoring. 
uh, and um, uh, there are of course many um, existing open source uh, and, and other algorithms available out there that you can easily now tap into as long as they provide a way of you to to feed a frame in, in jpeg format you can you can use them and just to give you some yes yeah, so, so this is as neil said in the upcoming uh, release on the research uh, robots uh, just to give you some inspiration these are two popular open source vision system there's uh, yolo which is a generic sort of object detection system there are many others um, uh, so I'm, I'm sure there are exciting applications to do there and uh, open pose which is a very powerful way of uh, detecting poses of many um, people essentially a skeleton that will be estimated for every user and these are uh, especially open poses a little bit more power hungry even though we have a um, fairly capable cpu uh, it is still not uh, possible to do this kind of processing so if you, you have so then you need a, a dedicated uh, gpu card uh, on an external server so this is something I that agree. you can do now uh, by using the uh, external processing system so i think uh, that is all we have for you uh, in terms of the presentation so now we will move into a, a little q a uh, session and I yes. think we will have the camera. Let me turn the camera around. Oh, there we are. Something on. Let me turn it a little bit more. Uh, there you are, right? right. Uh, great. great. So, so I, I see, see uh, we, have we have some questions. questions. Uh, feel free, free to keep, keep uh, asking some, some more questions, questions in the Q&A section, section and, and we'll, uh, we'll get, get to them. them. Uh, the, the, the first question, question we have, have uh, is uh, about uh, the speed of uh, the computer division. Uh, so uh, the question is, uh, we say the, the reassigning is at 10 hertz uh, interval, uh, but tracking is faster. Is, it, is the tracking done at faster intervals? Uh, yeah, so, uh, so right now, uh, everything, everything runs at the same cycle. Uh, we are um, uh, in the upcoming release. Uh, we are uh, uh, experimenting with that capability of, of doing tracking uh, at the higher frame rate. So essentially, there are frames captured every uh, well, basically at uh, thirty frames per second. Uh, but the but the vision pipeline, as it is now, runs on. Um, on every third frame then essentially uh, but uh, yes we have the capability of running uh, user tracking at the faster um, rate uh, but I would uh, I can't guarantee that this will be in the release that we have now but I think we will have this in, uh, in the future if, if we want to uh, uh, but um, yeah yeah and I mean that's that's a general um uh, that's generally how how how, how uh, it works at Project Robotics. Uh, you know, if you have any need or anything you would like to do, contact us, and uh, we'll uh, we'll see if we can make it available uh, for you. Uh, there, we uh, internally have access to um, you know deeper into the to the OS layer of the robot. Uh, whereas, as a as a researcher, as a customer, you you only have access to the to the what you can access through the SDK. Mm -hmm. uh, so if there's something that you would like to have more access to, like just reach out to us and ask us and we'll see if we can include it in the next version of the robot. Yeah, yeah we should say that the camera, external camera stream access, uh, there it's possible to get the full frame rate at 30 frames per second, if you want to. Uh, great, uh, we have, uh, I jump directly into the next question here. Uh, and uh, let's see, uh, we had a question, I think, where was it? Uh, yes, here. Um, so the question is, uh, can you also detect uh, open mouth uh, to detect uh, as a person, person uh, hinting a person starting uh, to uh, want to start speaking? Would mm. that be possible to do with the robot? Uh, currently it's, uh... Uh, it's not supported. This is actually something that we've looked into and uh, this is also something that we might have a solution for it And in that case, I would uh, think it's a it's a dedicated network that will uh, calculate speech activity. It's uh, it's something that we have 
uh, been experimenting with, I should say. So it's not uh, in the current release. Only detecting open mouth, I think, is not going to be very help helpful because people open their mouths for for many other reasons. And it's more about uh, to detect speech. It's more about the dynamics, how you how the mouth moves over time, that is important. But um, um, but yes, that might also be possible from. Um, uh, from a set of, uh, of landmarks that are calculated in the face. This is something I didn't talk about now, but we essentially there are also a set of points uh, being calculated on the face. Uh, so yes, this is not, it's not available, but I think it's uh, somehow a low-hanging low fruit that, that uh, we can expect to, yeah. to include it in future releases. And I can also mention that uh, there are other aspects of turn taking and uh, that is not on then on the division but on the microphone so uh, and managing turn taking and uh, and having that uh, work robustly is also something you can use the microphone for so for example yeah. the speech direction where is the speech coming from and this is something that we're already using in the in the microphone uh, so we can uh, detect what user is speaking um, so there are it, it, they they go they interlace each other the different uh, modalities of the, the vision or the, and the uh, and the sound yeah uh, great uh, so let's see let's uh, find another question um, uh, are there any plans to differentiate between twins or people who look similar uh, to be assigned as uh, unique users. Uh, that's a very good question. It's not. I wouldn't say that there are uh, plans to do that. I mean, we. Um, I mean, of course, you can. Uh, uh, you could think of uh, uh, other uh, networks that look at look at the full body and also can take sort of clothing into account and so on. So, so you, uh, uh, and this is, uh, yeah, this is something that could be included, but I don't. I don't think it's something. Uh, that we're planning to do uh, at the moment. Technically, you could, uh, but not. You would have to go on other cues than uh, the face only, if uh, if they're so similar, so that the face prints will be essentially identical. Yeah, and I guess it's also this is highly dependent on the use case. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, some use cases the robot is interacting with with a known known set of people. Uh, so you, mm. so you know if they will be looking similar or not, uh, or if it's standing at a, like an airport or a train station, there will be a lot of people and a lot of strangers, and we will interact with maybe thousands of people every day. Uh, so all of these different use cases and different tasks, I guess, put different requirements on the on the on the robot and the computer. Yeah. Um, so the another question we have here is uh, maybe a little more of a general question, uh, but I think it's still an interesting one. Uh, will social robots help people become less afraid of robots and AI? Do you see social robots becoming an integral integral part of the human society? Uh, personally, yes, I definitely do, and I think uh, it's very that this is why it's very important how we uh, design our social robots and how we design the interactions with uh, with robots. Uh, and this is, I think, the, at the core, really, of, of what Ferret Robotics is doing, that we're trying to uh, make these interactions as uh, uh, as friendly and uh, engaging, and, and sort of we're trying to bring all the positive qualities of uh, uh, of human interaction uh, into uh, into this mix. Uh, uh, but it's, uh, um, yeah, uh, in short, I think. Uh, I think it can it can really make people be less afraid of technology if uh, if we do this in the right way. Yeah, and I think the the answer there, like to do it in the right way, is really is really key. Um, there is a lot of uh, writing and discussion about computer vision and their implications for you know, uh, detecting uh, people's faces and keeping track of, of where people are moving and and so on. Uh, and I think uh, that is a scenario that we could end up with, uh, where facial recognition technologies and, and robots are used to um, uh, oversee people and, and they, to, to track them and, uh, and mm. for that use. Uh, but it can also be used uh, to enhance the interaction between between uh, human and machine, uh, yes. and perhaps humans, uh, perhaps machines really understand humans and interact with us in a natural way. And I guess that's what we see at Photobotics as 
how we see this technology is being used. Um, so uh, hopefully we can nudge the industry and nudge the world in that direction to use these really powerful technologies and new um, mm -hmm. revolution that's essentially going on uh, in, in a positive way and in a way that will uh, help people uh, and bridge this gap between, between technology. And as we say, make technology more human. Uh, we don't want to, mm, people to become uh, more technological. <laughs> Um, right, so another question, uh, maybe more narrow in the scope, uh, is uh, will the robot mix pictures of human faces with real human beings? Uh, and if not, how to distinguish between a real person and, and pictures? Uh, right, so uh, yes, it will indeed uh, uh, perceive also a picture as a face, as Nils uh, demonstrated here in the uh, in the example with the face tracking, if you if you hold up a picture, it will actually detect those uh, faces in the picture as real faces. And uh, currently, there is no uh, um, simple way of uh, or yeah, I, I can't really see how that would be avoided if this is uh, the problem. I think this is one of the uh, uh, one of the key er one of the few areas I should say where depth cameras really have uh, have an advantage. So, so if you really want to do uh, face identification, if you really want to make sure that this is the person uh, who they claim to be, then you can, uh, then a depth camera is much harder to fool where you're actually getting the three dimensional shape, although people have been able to fool them as well, but then you can't, uh, you can't fool them with the picture. But in this case, yes, uh, a picture will look like a face to the robot. Yeah. And I think you had a very good example in your presentation that uh, uh, you can you can sort of fool the algorithms of the machine, but you can also fool the algorithms of, of, of our, our uh, brains. Uh, and uh, we are also sort of running some software inside our heads. So I think uh, it's also possible to fool humans. Uh, it's just di just uh, different ways to to uh, to fool us or different things that will throw us off. Uh, great. So another question. Um, uh, wow, very exciting presentation. Thank you. Uh, what are the next uh, expression you plan to detect? Right. Uh, so uh, so currently uh, there are um, uh, the network that we are using uh, is able to detect uh, happiness, anger, uh, sadness, and surprise. So. Um, so these are sort of the low hanging fruits and essentially you, uh, there are ways to access them. What, what we need to do is to, um, first of all, ensure that they are robust enough so it, that makes sense to, to expose them uh, in an easy to use way. And it, so we get predictable results essentially. Uh, and then I think it's a lot about uh, what use cases uh, people come up with. Uh, so, so there I think we want to hear uh, from, from the community as well. What, uh, um, what do people want to do with this feature and, and what would be most relevant to, to real applications? Do we want to detect if people uh, get angry in a customer service uh, situation or, um, and if so, what, how, how would we uh, deal with that information? Uh, or, um, yeah, the, yeah, so to us, the, the most uh, that's why we chose uh, smile as uh, as the first thing uh, because it it has a very clear uh, use case. It really is a social glue, and and it, it's really really important in a functioning social interaction. Whereas uh, the other emotions are um, perhaps more specialized use cases. I would say maybe yeah. in storytelling or or some some kind of a game. Uh, applications they are important or, or if you you work with children and you want to um, uh, for example train people in in uh, uh, interaction with emotions or, or yeah. things like this yeah. uh, great we have just two minutes left I think we have three questions so if we're if we're fast we can uh, hopefully answer them all um, so the first one, uh, is Farhat currently able to express emotion through speech? Um, so essentially Farhat is using uh, off the shelf, uh, I mean, we're not making our own 
TTS voices, text-to-speech voices. So we're using uh, available voices from uh, mainly from two vendors, Acapella and uh, Amazon, uh, Amazon Poly. And uh, uh, some of these voices will have uh, tags uh, in them that you can you can tell it to um, uh, to use a different kind of uh, uh, emotional expressions, but. Uh, Mm, they're not always very convincing, so so I wouldn't say that this is a general feature that we do have. What we can do, however, is to use pre-recorded speech. So if you want to have that kind of application and you have a limited number of uh, things that you want the robot to say, then of course this is an option to to pre-record speech in different emotions uh, that fits your application. Uh, great. So I think we have time for just one last question. Um, uh, it's a pretty direct question. Uh, can you change the confidence in the face print evaluation uh, to differentiate between similar faces better? Uh, yes, this is a setting uh, that is configurable at the at the lower level. I'm not uh, I'm not sure if it is exposed to. Uh, it's not exposed to the skill level, but I'm pretty sure that you can uh, go into a configuration file and uh, and change that confidence but there is also uh, the possibility then to expose the face print to the skill level you see so, so if you want to do your own comparison then you can also access uh, the whole the whole vector of this uh, 256 numbers and do uh, comparisons at the skill level uh, all right. Uh, thank you so much Jonas and uh, thank you all sitting at home I, I, I assume uh, in these times for joining us in this webinar uh, and uh, hopefully it will has been informational and fun for you to get a glimpse of uh, the Ferrat robot and the vision system that the Ferrat is, is, is running. Uh, if you have any more questions don't hesitate to reach out to us you know by email or in social media uh, and if you have any if you have some specific questions can I do this or can I do that uh, reach out to us or you know send us a question through uh, the, the support uh, mode or uh, in the community Slack channel. Uh, I think that's it for today. So let's wrap up uh, and we hope to see you in other channels and in future webinars. Uh, everyone uh, have a good day and take care of yourself. Goodbye.